from the time they hear about you to when they interact with you online to when they walk into your physical space, there should be a connected story and it it should be a compelling story that differentiates you from other experiences. Welcome to your daily real estate syndication show. This is your host, Dina Burke. Today, my guest is Matt Ferguson, Chief Innovation Officer for Storyland Studios. Matt has a strong belief in the power of places and spaces to transform lives and lift the spirit. He learned this early in his career when he was a creative executive with the Walt Disney Company. He was with Walt Disney during unprecedented times of growth for the park and experiences. He had the opportunity to serve on the opening teams for numerous projects, including ESPN Worldwide of Sports, Disney's Animal Kingdom Park, and multiple resorts. In his consulting career now at Plain Joe, a Storyland studio and beyond, Matt has helped iconic places tell their stories. Right now, Matt and the Storyland team are also currently working on multiple neo-urban developments that have been initiated by churches to bless their communities, returning the church to the center of village life. He's an owner and principal designer at Route 19 Inn in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, named one of the best new boutique hotels by Style Blueprint. Can't wait for you to hear why Matt thinks Disney is one of the world's greatest mousetraps. It's all about story. Let's listen in. Matt, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited about this show because it's a little different than the ones that we normally do. Oftentimes we have operators who are, you know, rolling in multifamily and and things like that. But I know you also dip your, your toe or foot or probably your whole hand and arm into that, but you're your pond is much larger. So I'm excited for you to share what you do. um, And then we'll kind of get into some of the questions of what makes you tick and what you're passionate about. So what's your background, Matt? Currently, I'm with a company called Storyland Studios, and I'm one of the principals there. And uh, basically, we are a kind of a merry band of former Disney Imagineers and marketeers that uh, really any organization can hire to bring that level of storytelling experience, excellence to your project, whatever it may be. So, you know, we're master planners, architects, interior designers, branding people. And really that's more of my background. I came up through the ranks at Disney on the branding and marketing side and, uh, you know, really trying to figure out how do we explain these vast experiences in my case at Walt Disney World, I was in Orlando to the world and how do we summarize these kind of crazy huge experiences into a, a story that is crystal clear to everyone. And then I also had a branding and marketing firm for a while that specialized in experiences and you know real estate developments. We worked on Jack Nicholas and Arnold Palmer real estate communities. We we actually did a rebranding for our local kind of real estate uh organization and MLS in our area. And then we also have worked on, you know, resorts like Grove Park Inn and Pinehurst and Pebble Beach to destinations like Asheville Tourism and I Love New York. So, uh, you know, kind of specializing in telling the story of places and marketing and branding. I love this. I have so many questions around this. We can explore here, but let's just talk about story. Obviously, it's in the name of the company that you now work with, but as you approach your work, as you are a former Disney Imagineer, which by the way, it sounds like that's like an industry term. You're not just saying like, oh, this is something. This is like an actual like category that people live in is Imagineers. Is that correct? Yes. And and my, uh, I was more of, I guess, marketeer, uh, worked on the branding and marketing side, but we, we also have uh, folks from Walt Disney Imagineering, which is their department that actually has the architects, the spatial designers that create the theme parks and resorts at, at Disney. And uh, I was I was on the more of the branding and marketing side, but we have both covered within our organization. These are just fun words outside of like, you know, CapEx and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some of the normal things that we talk about on the show. So um would love to hear just conceptually as you think about story. Obviously, it's a backdrop for everything that you do, it seems like. If you can tell me a little bit about the way you approach story, let's let's say how do you approach story with your 
day-to-day work life and maybe like in the context of family. I, I'm just trying to think of like how you can extract a principle from an application in something like amusement and theme parks and then just communication. Yeah. Well, well, we believe story is really core to the human condition. It's how we're wired as humans. We we are inspired by story. We're moved by story. It's just how people are designed. So if you're creating an experience, whether it's a real estate property that you're investing in or whatever it is, we believe, we've learned that it should be driven by story. And, and that's why Disney has been able to create these most popular places in the world, these human mousetraps that that draw more people than any other experiences do. And, and so we're just kind of taking that logic and that methodology and applying it to whatever spaces and places we work on. So we work on multifamily, we work on RV parks, we work on uh, you know retail locations and shopping centers and stuff like that. But we figure out what is the core story of, of this place. And we, we like to say we tell stories in three dimensions. We consider the three dimensions to be strategic, interactive, and spatial storytelling. So if you can connect connect a story across those three dimensions, you're doing well. So strategic storytelling is the story that walks away with you. It's the emotional feeling you get when you think about a place or your favorite brand like Disney or Apple or what have you. Interactive story is the story that you engage with. So before they ever walk into a space that you might create, they're probably looking at you online, either in your social media or in your uh, you know website, et cetera. And then spatial storytelling is the story you walk into. So from the time they hear about you to when they interact with you online to when they walk into your physical space, there should be a connected story and it, sh- it should be a compelling story that differentiates you from other experiences. How do you apply that to? Do you have kids? I do. Yes. You five. Do. As a matter of fact. Yes. Hey, five. How old are your kids? They are uh, adults. Uh, our youngest is 20 now. And uh, so we're experiencing the empty nest for the first time, which is exciting. How do you or how did you implement the strategic, interactive and spatial components of storytelling as you interacted with your kids? I'm trying to get this into like a, you know, I I can envision this in building a storyland and I'm just trying to transfer this to something that we can use daily. Sure. Um, You know, I I, I guess I did apply it uh, in in parenting. I mean, we, we had a definite sense of story for our family. Like this is what we're about. We're we're generous people. In our case, we're people of faith, and we, uh, uh, you know, had the idea of serving God first, and then serving others, and then ourselves in that order. And uh, so that was a big part of our story, and it's kind of how we raised our kids, and it's it's uh, the story that they're continuing to carry with them when they get older. So yeah, I guess that's a practical application of storytelling. I love that. I think about all of the opportunities that, you know, folks have for public speaking. And I think it's easier as the listener than as the speaker (laughs) to decide how, how folks are at telling stories as they're engaging you in their story unfolding. But what you do oftentimes is it's like an experiential story unfolding as you walk across a threshold of a place. Can you give us an example of a project that either in the past that you've worked on or currently working on and how you implemented these three dimensions? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a real estate investor myself. And so I invested in this 1948 motor lodge in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina. It, it had, it's a property that was abandoned for like 10 years. I mean, frankly, it was a little scary. You know, it was a little Bates Motelish when you, when you looked at it, you know. Was it vacant? It was vacant for like 10 years. Yes. Ooh, and, that is scary. And so, so we bought, you know, we bought this thing and we're like, what do we turn this into? Do we turn it into an apartment or do we turn it into, do we, go back to the use of a hotel. And the more we thought about this place, like it is at the convergence of two rivers, like right outside of the Great Smokies National Park. And we're like, this thing has to be a hotel. And and so then we started thinking about, well, what is the storyline that would make this hotel unique? Because it's it's on kind of a a main strip with a lot of other different uh, 
hotels and things. It was called Rocky Waters Motel. And there are like a half a dozen hotels in the area with some derivative of stone and water, you know. And so we thought, okay, what's the story of this place? It was built in 1948 at the height of the post-war kind of everybody getting in their cars and taking road trips across America and going to the national parks. And it's right outside the Great Smokies National Park, the most popular one in America. And it's right 10 minutes from the Blue Ridge Parkway, you know, the most popular scenic drive in America. So we came up with this core story idea of this is about a retro road trip. What what would that retro road trip feel like in the mid-century period in, in the mountains? And so we kind of uh, invented this little uh, vernacular of architecture we called mid-century mountain and we sort of updated it. Love and, it. Uh, yeah. Uh, updated it with that in mind. And so if you go to our website, route19n.com, you can see that uh, the rooms are really cool. They kind of, the whole place takes you back in time. We brought local artists in to create like totem poles and murals and, you know, made it very Instagrammable. We've got an old 1951 car that sits outside permanently and uh, right next to an old gas pump and uh, just have so many cool little like vignettes to hang out in. And uh, yeah, it's it's become really popular in the area. We've won an award for like best new, you know, on the list of best new boutique hotels. And uh, we, we've even had a, we have regular guests now. We've been open about three years. We had a guy that came to the property a couple of months ago and showed us, he tattooed the logo of Route 19 in. Oh the arm. my gosh. So we have some real super fans. I don't know <laughs> any brand that uh, other than Disney that I've worked on where people tattoo things on their arms. So, so that was a real win, but it all started with storytelling and uh, it really transformed this, this property. Okay. So a couple of questions about this. How do you, number one, who's we, did you have a business partner? Is this your wife? Who are you going in on this deal with? Yeah, well, my wife and I, um, actually, the the initial purchaser was my father-in-law, who is a hotel operator. He's got a resort down in uh, the Orlando area. And uh, initially, I was just doing the rebranding and redesign as kind of a labor of love for pop. And then uh, then he got into the the remodel, and, and, and he had a, another partner as well. And they got into the remodel and... Uh, Th- those buildings are built like tanks. I mean, they're made of concrete construction, but, you know, they discovered little electrical issues and plumbing and, you know, it just kind of ballooned to more than they thought. So they approached my wife, Lori, and me and said, hey, would you guys like to invest? And and we were really kind of invested emotionally in in, in it. And so we decided to throw some cash in as well as minority partners. So that's how it all came about. Okay. So when you come to the table and this can be for this project or for another one, and I'm imagining a, you know, a boardroom or a table and the, this is your initial meeting and you're like, we're going to find out the story. Do you create the story? Do you ask questions that find out what story already exists? How does the story come to life in a project like this? Yeah, we have a, we have our ways. So when, when we uh, meet with a client, we have uh story discovery meeting, a blue sky meeting, and it's loosely based on the process that Walt Disney went through when he created Disneyland. And uh, we really start with the words first. We we have a phrase, we like to say words create worlds, you know, so we, we sit around the table with the client, uh, you know, whoever is the owner of the property. And uh, we look at really the, the three aspects of story are character setting and plot. So Character is, it could be people that were involved in bringing this thing to life. It could be the, it definitely should be the audience you're trying to reach. What kind of people do you think would be interested in in this experience? And then the setting, you know, we really believe in what we call soil specific design. So we want to look at the context of where we are, where this property is. Uh, In this case, it was in the Smoky Mountains, and that had a distinct influence on. The design, you know, my my partner Mel McGowan, who helped found the company with his brother Peter, has a phrase. He calls it the United States of Generica, where you where you drive down any like a commercial road in America, and it's like, yeah, there's that big box store, and there's I, I could be in Nebraska, I could be in Southern California, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, we hate that. <laughs> we think that whatever we create should look like it belongs in the area and should be distinctive. And so that's setting. So character setting plot. Uh, there is some storyline of, you know, what led to this this time that we're we might be refreshing something, we might be building something. There, there's some sort of story we want to tell, whether it's a fictional story we make up or it's historic or what have you. It could be about the people that came together to create something. Um, and in this case, there was a definite story about this era of America where it was the glory days of road trips and we wanted to take people back to that time so that became our our plot and and so at the inter intersection of character setting and plot is always a big idea and so we we basically have an exercise where we pull those story elements out of our clients and then we uh, come out at the end of the day with like a very clear storyline that then informs a thousand design decisions you know and and whatever your budget is if everything is being driven by story, it's it's going to be better. It's going to be more effective at moving people to the behavior you want to drive them to, whether it's renting your apartment or whether it's getting in your office space or whether it's staying overnight in a hotel. Yeah, that leads to my next question. Is creating a story-driven investment profitable? I mean, I, I'm imagining the answer is yes, but um, I'm also imagining that you are willing to incur more expenses for the sake of the story. So talk to us about how you balance profit um, and returns with what you're investing to kind of, you know, make the story compelling. Yeah, it, it really does not have to be more expensive. It's just you're, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be uh, purchasing fixtures and paint and roofing materials and furnishings and stuff like that it but it might as well be informed by a crystal clear story and then it's going to be more effective it absolutely does not have to be more expensive you know generally somebody's going to unless they DIY something they're going to hire some sort of design firm with architects interior designers etc um, but you know we add a little bit of extra to it and thinking of that sort of story psychology behind everything before before we design anything. And we also have, uh, as part of our strategic storytelling capability, we have uh, a team that does uh, strategic, uh, all kinds of strategic things, including feasibility studies. And, uh, you know, we'll look at the highest and best use for a property. We'll look at how a property is projected to perform and we'll create that pro forma. And when you add a little bit of story, you're making a property more distinctive. You're giving people a reason to select this property versus another one. And we find that it does yield uh, a pretty good delta in terms of uh, additional financial performance. It's not a mousetrap for nothing. Those, uh, uh, I mean, right? there's a reason why it works. <laughs> And so we do speak the language of real estate. We do use terms like CapEx that are built into our pro formas and our uh, strategic, uh, you know, feasibility studies that we put together. Mm. Matt, when you think about the work you're doing right now, what gets you most excited? I'm imagining there may be things you can tell us, maybe things you can't tell us, but what gets you really excited? You know, really what gets us most excited is there's a whole cause related side to our studio mm. uh, where we love to work with nonprofits. So recently, for example, we took on a pro bono client called AIM, A-I-M, and they are one of the top organizations in the world that fights human trafficking. And so they're based in Cambodia, which has been a hotbed for human trafficking. And they literally... Uh, partner, they bring uh, paramilitary and law enforcement over from the U.S. that partner with local law enforcement, and they raid these places and arrest these guys that are that are keeping people enslaved. A lot of times, children, and they rescue them. and uh, And so, we are helping them not only with their brand story, but also thinking about some of their their spaces. They have these really neat homes where they bring these. Uh, People that have been rescued and give them counseling and job skills and all kinds of stuff. So we're helping them with uh, kind of the spatial design for that as well. And to us, that 
that kind of thing is the most rewarding. Or, or we're working on a, working with an organization called Johnny and Friends. They work with disabled people around the world and bring wheelchairs and all kinds of things. And uh, they're creating an international disability center where it's a visitor experience where you can come and understand the plight of uh, disabled people over the years. And Johnny Erickson Tata, the uh, founder of this organization, is a powerhouse of a lady who is amazing, who was actually very much involved in the uh, Americans for Disabilities Act. And uh, so there's kind of a little bit of a history of disability. And uh, there's even like a experience you can walk in an immersive art experience, like those immersive Van Goghs, where, where you can experience artwork from disabled people. We, we've got like these immersive pods you can go into where you can walk into a disabled veterans garage, or you can walk into a hut in a village in Central America where a mom is caring for her uh, disabled daughter. And uh, and then there's an opportunity at the end to actually like put wheelchairs together to send her around the world. And it's gonna be a real powerhouse for creating, you know, donations and driving volunteer volunteers for that organization. So. That's really what gets us charged up is that kind of uh, cause-based stuff that we do. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I'm sure it's a huge blessing to the organizations that you're working with because I think it's such a huge, I don't know, barrier. Because if, you, if you're if you not telling the story in a compelling way, regardless of how compelling the story is, I think you're, you're missing a whole other dimension of how others can be moved to involvement, catalyzed into action, whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. We we created this thing called the Poverty Encounter for the Children's Hunger Fund. I saw that on your yeah. website. I was going to ask you about that. I'm glad you brought it up. Yes. So basically, you walk into this thing and it's like you're in an airport. And then you actually board a plane, you know, <laughs> board a plane in quotes. And uh, we have a like a simulator. Uh, of this air flight and then you land and then you're at this hub where you can go into like four different regions of the world and experience Haiti after the earthquake or uh, the brickyards of Nepal where they have children and child labor or the dumps of Guatemala where people actually live in, in garbage dumps. And you, you get to walk through these places and then at the end, we give people an opportunity to volunteer and pack meals to send around the world. And it's just been an amazing engine for uh, getting volunteers for like school groups and then also driving donations because they used to fly donors around the world to these impoverished places to help them understand what's going on. But you can imagine the multiplier effect of just having one in Southern California that people can visit. And uh, it's really created uh increases in their donations and volunteering. That's amazing. I know I was on your website, you know, and it's really impressive, impressive names. You've got Legoland, you've got Great America, you know, Sea Life, Sega, all these things. And then you see Poverty Encounter and you're like, what is this? And it was actually the thing that caught my attention the most. So um, yeah. for the listeners, I definitely recommend that you check out storylandstudios.com and see the work. Um, that Matt and his team are are doing something that you and I connected. We, you and I, ran into each other at a Redemptive Real Estate Conference in in Santa Barbara, and found out we had a common contact, and that I had recently visited a place that you have worked on. And I feel like this is a story also that needs to be told because anybody who I've mentioned Trillith Studios to doesn't know what I'm talking about. And when you distill it down to the numbers. Like, I mean, just by by way of amount that's been produced there in dollars, it's like mind blowing. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about Trillith Studios. Yeah, Trillith is really two places, the, the town of Trillith and Trillith Studios. Trillith Studios is one of the biggest, you know, busiest movie studios in the world. And it's where most of the Marvel movies have been made since Ant-Man, basically. So, you know, these are the highest grossing movies of all time and and they're also doing other movies for disney and other studios uh but they just have state-of-the-art facilities uh it's owned by dan Cathy, the 
former uh, CEO and chairman of uh, Chick-fil-A. His son is now the CEO of the business at, at Chick-fil-A. And so this is his new focus, but he's basically taking the same kind of service philosophies that Chick-fil-A has become famous for. And he's now using that to serve the creative community. And so uh, they just really do a great job of providing not only facilities, but service for these movie productions. And then across the street, they built a town that is designed for the creative community. And so if you think about the, the storyline that we've helped them work on for this place, Trilla, it's a, uh, it's a big idea of a gateway to inspiration. So whether you live at Trilla or whether you are producing your movie at Trillith or you work at Trillith, it is a, a gateway to being inspired. And, and they're really all about this big idea of human flourishing. And, uh, and and they believe if, you know, if we take good care of people that live there at Trillith, they're going to make better, more uplifting uh, content across the street at the movie studio. So it's it's a pretty cool philosophy that they have there. It is. And Trilla, how many acres is it? It's huge. Oh, gosh, I should know this, but it is gigantic for sure. Oh, like 10,000 acres. Does that sound right? Sounds like in the ballpark. Something like that. Yeah. So um, I actually was at Trillith with Dan Cathy for the day. I was with John Maxwell and we hung out. And a couple of things that impressed me, he gave us a walking tour. I mean, here's this man who has like, you know, grown this build business into a $40 billion business, second generation, and has now raised up his son, who's third generation, which we all know is incredibly rare for that to happen past the second generation. And he's walking around just like sipping a spendrift, telling us about <laughs> what he was thinking when he was dreaming up Trillith Studios. And he he said something that I'll never forget. And that we actually talked about for a moment that day was, he said, sometimes you have to jump the fence. You know, sometimes you're in your little area, you're in your place for him. I'm imagining that was Chick-fil-A, right? And he says, sometimes you just have to jump the fence and you have to see what's on the other side and you have to take a risk to see what's out there. And to me, in hindsight, maybe he jumped the fence to kind of take a risk or maybe bet the farm on uh, on, on Trillith Studios. But I love his concept and his attention to detail absolutely blew me away. We were sitting there on the street corner and he's He's telling us about why they chose specific pavers on the ground that they chose, which maybe you were involved in that. I don't know. Uh, and then he's like, can you guys hold on for a minute? And he walks over and he he begins to talk with the landscapers, the guys who are putting the dirt on. And he's like, I, I, sorry, I just had to tell him to hold on. We need some more loam on that. <laughs> I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, this guy. I mean, he his attention to detail unto, like you said, the, the end of the story of kind of being a birthing place for massive creativity and inspiration um, that will be purveyors of beauty uh, to make the world a better place. I, I loved the way that he he presented all of that. So it was fun that you and I connected on that. And that's what you're working on. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, every time I'm around Dan and his team, it's just like a uh, clinic in servant leadership. You know, I remember the first meeting that I had with him where we're kind of working on their master plan for the property. And uh, of course we had Chick-fil-A brought in, catered in. Of course, so did and, we. Uh, yeah. We expected yeah. nothing less. Oh yeah. And um, anyway, I, I look up and I notice that Dan is like bussing our tables, you know, and here yeah. Dan is this, you know, in charge of this multi-billion dollar operation. And, and uh, he just cares enough about, people that he's willing to do all the little things and, and and hospitality is important and he makes you feel welcome and that's just you learn so much being around uh, somebody like Dan it's pretty awesome it is yeah you know the, like you said the attention to detail where he's like addressing the loam and he said that his father true it Kathy said that he they always they had these young kids coming in and they they really wanted to kind of teach them civility, not just customer service, but civility. And they were teaching them the specifics about making the burger. And they said, you got to have the pickles so that they date, not mate. Don't put the pickles on top of each other, <laughs> put them wow. next to each other. And so when I think about the pickles, you know, and like the, the attention to detail, it's very, 
Um, it's just integrous. It seems like in the way that he approaches the projects that he takes on. So from the yeah, loan, and number the one, and number one in it all is caring about people. I had a daughter that worked at Chick Fil A in high school. Had the opportunity to open up a new store, and uh, so she got to bring a guest to the grand opening, and and so I got to go with her, and and uh, they showed this video before the the thing started that brought a tear to your eye because it was like we think about the person that's coming into the into our restaurant what they might have gone through that day they could be coming straight from cancer treatment or could be a mom that has a neurodivergent child or what you know and you're just like oh my gosh they're teaching these high school kids that are working in the back to think this way about people so when they say my pleasure it's not just a rote line it's it's truly like embedded in their culture to really care about people. And that's what sets them apart. It's not just chicken. Yeah, I agree. Well, I'm excited to see the work at Trilith continue to unfold. It does sound like it's a story that's still being written, yes. uh, which is exciting. Yeah. We're uh, kicking off our next round of uh, master planning on uh, Monday, as a matter of fact. So we're excited hey. about what's next. Yeah. Okay. And for the listener, you can go out and have a tour. Just like yes. you can in any other movie studio. It's incredible. We uh, drove through the field where Wakanda Forever was filmed. We walked through the studio where Chris Pratt. Was, oh, we saw the, the fire hydrant where Chris Pratt's dog always hung out. And there's like a sign by it now. So <laughs> that was fun to see as well. Uh, well, Matt, this has been so great. I, I'd love for you if you have any parting words for the listener, whether it's around story, whether it's around real estate investment, whatever it is, love for you to share any parting thoughts that you have. Well, I mean, obviously, we, we'd love to help anyone with any experience you might be working on. But even if, you know, if you, even if you don't hire a firm like, like us, uh, just think about your story. Think about what is the story of this place that I'm creating? Or if you're a real estate investor, more of a passive investor, you're not involved in the design or creation of a place, look for places that actually have some sort of differentiated story from another apartment complex, another retail out, you know, retail center, whatever you're investing in. If if you find a place that sort of has a brand differentiation, has a true story behind it it's just going to perform better because people would rather go there than somewhere else. And uh, so I think that's a good, good rule of thumb for your audience. That's super helpful. And actually I have one more question now that you've answered that. Okay. Yeah. About your work. I mean, I, I think inspiration, right? I think excitement. I know that your day-to-day probably isn't always filled with that, but where do you find sources of inspiration? What brings you like aha moments along along the way when then you can be tra- it can be transferred to your work. Yeah, for me it's travel. It's uh, when you go to different places and cultures, you're exposed to different ideas and different things, and and to me that's that's the biggest inspiration. Totally agree. Totally agree. How can people get a hold of you or find you? If they want to work with you and find out more about what you're doing. Yeah, you can check out our website at storylandstudios.com. And uh, yeah, if you want to email me, I'm Matt F, as in Ferguson, at storylandstudios.com. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story with all of us today. I appreciate it, Matt. You're welcome. Thank you for being with us again today. I hope that you have learned a lot from the show. Don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you're telling your friends about the Real Estate Syndication Show and how they can also build wealth in real estate. You can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today.